Hare Om Namaha Om Hari Vida Dhyan Mama Sarva Rakshangani Astangri Padmaha Padagendra Prishte Dharari Chamasi Gadesha Chapa Pashantathana Ashtagana Ashtabahu Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya From an external perspective, ISKCON, the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, quotations on each side of the acronym, appears to be bona fide. It conducts opulent deity worship at many of its temples. Its leading devotees dress pukka, and they cut pompous, an air of pompous profile and dignity. The cult conducts an annual meeting every spring in West Bengal. Actually, it flaunts many such external manifestations. But we should know that superficialities alone do not determine whether an entity is spiritually or devotionally bona fide. The link to the parampara is never established by such external factors alone, which at their very best are either secondary or complementary considerations. The main criterion for maintaining or even first having a link to the Guru Parampara is following the order of the spiritual master, which is evidenced in the following excerpt, an excerpt that we quoted during the last discourse. This is from a letter to one of Prabhupada's original disciples dated October 1967. Kirtanananda may be eager to address in the Harvard University, but recently he has lost his link on account of disobedience. Kirtanananda has developed a different consciousness of Maya, which is misuse of one's minute independence offered by Krishna. So it is my definite opinion that his lecture anywhere now will bear no spiritual sequence. Actually, it's a great embarrassment to fall under the sway of official make shows and thus become bamboozled by the pretenses of superficial appearances. When these are combined with psychological manipulation, it will appear to many non-devotees and neophytes that there is spiritual authority or even devotional authority present. This pitfall is all the more lethal when the pretenders push along with it a kind of radiating mystical superiority. Yet, especially in the West, external appearances and similar symbolic representations hold far too much sway. They not only do this in the pseudo-spiritual and pseudo-devotional realms, but also in the mundane sphere. Let us take, for example, uh, what went down in a movie entitled Hostage. It's about 11 years old. 
spoiler alert, if you haven't watched this movie, I'm going to be giving away quite a bit of the plot here in describing this. So there's a hostage situation that develops at a swank castle or mansion in the foothills of Southern California and the local sheriff, Chief Officer Talley, responds to it. But then it exacerbates and it escalates so the California State Police come in and Chief Talley readily passes the baton to them and leaves the scene. About a half hour later, he is hijacked in his squad car and he's pulled into a back alley by force where another vehicle pulls up behind his and within it he can see that his wife and daughter have been gagged and kidnapped. He is instructed by their captors that he has to go back to the scene, somehow or other get inside that mansion and retrieve a compact disc in there that they want. And that's the only way he can save his family. So he returns, and there's a lot of friction with the state police when he demands to be put back in charge, but they, they work out a plan, and they try it, and it fails. Then, just after that, Tally receives on his, on his cell phone that, it, that his family's captors had transferred to him. He receives a call and he's given an ultimatum. He turns the tables on it to some extent, but he says he has another plan, which the state police cooperate with, but it also fails. So they say they're going to send the SWAT team in, and they more or less have to put him under arrest to restrain him. But nightfall has already come, and just at that time, an ominous dark van pulls up, and out from it come 10 agents in full SWAT gear, replete with camouflage face paint, and three bright white letters emblazoned on the back of their black uniforms. The lead agent goes up to the lead agent of the California State Police and tells her it's now a federal crime scene and that the FBI is taking over. She acquiesces. That other lead agent then calls over to Tally and says, you now work with us, brings him in their van, where he immediately sees that the whole operation is a ruse. They're all counterfeits. They're all part of that criminal operation that's holding his family hostage. And now he's going to have to cooperate with them to get inside the mansion, which is their objective. Although they were counterfeits, they sure looked the part. They sure looked like they were members of an FBI SWAT team. They had all the gear, and they acted like they were, but they were pretenders. Similar, similarly, the ISCON leading secretaries and its so-called spiritual masters or gurus, they looked the part quite well. They act like they are, just what they say they are, but in point of fact, they're all counterfeits. And it's been that way for the last just short of 40 years. The ISKCON machine rages on with its fix-it-as-you-go strategy, relentlessly buying more time day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. Once in a while, the cult trips up. Something gets exposed and it goes into damage control. And then it resorts to a tactic known as reform. There's been three or four such institutional reforms since the disappearance of Srila Prabhupada in November of 1977. And they all have one thing in common. They're all unauthorized concoctions. Now, I'm going to present a quote from Dialectical Spiritualism, the Critique of Pascal. You may say that it doesn't quite apply, but actually it does, if you take the essence of it.
pseudo-religions, religions that cheat, are condemned in Srimad Bhagavatam. Any religious system which has no conception of God and which annually changes its resolutions is not a religion but a farce. So although there's a conception of God, obviously, in the ISKCON religion, and although it doesn't annually change its resolutions, the farcical element still remains. But there's another excerpt from one of Prabhupada's letters that hits the nail on the head. This is from a letter to one of his governing body commissioners, one of the four that was not part of the centralization scheme that we talked about in the last discourse and which we're going to continue talking about in this one. It was written to this governing body commissioner about six months after Prabhupada was able to stifle the centralization scheme, but he was not able to root it, as we are going to show clearly. Here's how that excerpt reads. It will be another hippie edition. Gradually, the Krishna consciousness idea will evaporate. Another change, another change, Every day, another change. Stop all this. Don't manufacture ideas. But the ISKCON narrative rages on in the ascendant, and although it is rarely enunciated or put down in definitive written form, it still appears to have a triumphalism connected to it. But that is now coming to an end because the time has come to challenge that false narrative and that's just what this two-part series is all about. So let us now proceed to once again restate the quote, the excerpt from Prabhupada's letters that we left off with at the end of part one of this two-part series. It is a letter dated April 11th, 1972 to one of the chief governing body commissioners who arranged for that centralization scheme and that ad hoc meeting. Prabhupada writes to him, I beg to acknowledge your receipt of your letter dated April 7th, and I have noted the contents. The meeting of the GBC appeared to be very unconstitutional because all men were not informed or invited. Shama Sundar was not invited, Sudama was not invited, Krishna Das was not invited, Tamal Krishna was not invited, neither I was informed. Why? You cannot hold meeting of eight persons without inviting all others. Seven may be a quorum, that's all right, but you cannot convene without a general announcement to all the members and myself. The whole thing appeared to be giving all power to a Treya Rishi. I cannot understand why instead of one GBC man, a person outside the commission was given so much power, and there was to be immediate action, without divulging the matter to the devotees. And I am surprised that none of the GBC members detected the defects in the procedure. What will happen when I am not here? Shall everything be spoiled by GBC? Notice he uses the term shall. Not just will, but shall everything be spoiled by the GBC. So we need to understand why this particular deviation and not the others that we talked about in part one was not uprooted. It was not uprooted because its goals were still attained, not by this particular uh, meeting in New York in early April or late March of 1972, but instead they were attained by the GBC via other surreptitious means. What were those goals? The goal was to have secret meetings where the devotees at large really didn't know what took place in the meetings. Now, although minutes are produced 
and then they're distributed to some people after the annual GBC meetings. The fact is, many things take place in that meeting which are not known, known about by the general populace of devotees and not accessible. In one sense, this is a minor factor because some such things, if the commission was bona fide, and it certainly isn't, but if it was, such, some things need to be kept secret. But nevertheless, Prabhupada says that something as big as this where one man outside the commission was going to control all the funds that were collected on magazine and book distribution, that everybody would find out about anyway in due course of time. So it needed to be divulged. But Prabhupada is saying here that immediate action without divulging, which they said in their notes, that they were not going to divulge to the devotees. So we can see, history shows us clearly the history of the quote-unquote ISKCON movement, that the GBC has messed up so many times, particularly in late March of 1978, which we shall get to again, which we shall never neglect, because it never can be neglected. So he says, why are you giving all the power to somebody who is outside the commission? But then before that he says, why wasn't everybody invited and informed, including himself, the spiritual master? He's not informed of this plan? So eight of these GBCs get together, and because seven creates a quorum, they think they can decide for the whole society without even informing Prabhupada of what they're planning to do? What the agenda is? Now, what were the goals? Yes, obviously, one of the goals is that they wanted to be able to act without his restrictions put on them, without him he able to uh, stop and stifle and overturn their resolutions. That went on in 1975, where he overturned, overturned all their resolutions. But more than that, what was going on here was the first attempt to usurp all the power to the GBC centralize the funds and centralize the power. In other words, take the power away from the temple presidents. It is not that Prabhupada, when he formed the GBC in late July of 1970, wanted to take the power away from the temple presidents. The governing body commission was meant to be advisors to the presidents. The devotees on the whole, with just a few exceptions here and there, would be under a temple president who would be their leader, who would give them their duties, their seva, who would instruct them, who would correct them. That was not to be taken away by the governing body commission. The commissioners, many of whom were presidents themselves anyway, of centers, were to go and travel amongst all the various centers and make sure everything was being done bona fide and give some guidance, give some advice, give some reassurance, tell them about recent uh, statements Prabhupada had made to them personally, privately, inform them of these upgrades that were in the works, but not to take away the power. But here in this scheme, they were wanting to take away the power. This is very important that you understand this because it is proof positive that this was not actually uprooted. This deviation was checked at this time, but it was checked superficially. It was not checked at a deep level. It resurfaced, and it resurfaced big time in late March of 1978, but it resurfaced before that. It even resurfaced while Prabhupada was still physically present before his great illness and debilitation in 1977. It resurfaced in 1975, where he had, where he, he read all the resolutions, he threw them all out, but before he did that, he actually, and I, I received this information from one of the governing body commissioners who was there, he actually said to them, all right, you take the movement, I'll take my bead back and the Hare Krishna mantra. Oh. That, that broke it. They couldn't lose him. They needed him as a figurehead. So 
They acquiesced. They capitulated. He threw out the resolutions. But the same syndrome, the same tendency was fully present in 1975. And of course, it reared its head in a way that it could not be uh, checked at all after he disappeared in March of 1978. But again, let us read the last sentence of this excerpt. What will happen when I am not here? Shall everything be spoiled by GBC? Well, in fact, everything has been spo spoiled by the GBC. It should become very self-evident to anybody who is without bias, without prejudice, and doesn't have a vested interest that the GBC has ruined Srila Prabhupada's ISKCON movement to the point that no reforms can bring it back. A revolution can bring it back, but not reform. So let us now proceed to one other excerpt from an important letter later on that year. Incidentally, this letter was to the other chief personality behind the centralization scheme. This is a very well-known letter. In fact, I think it would be indisputable, almost all devotees would agree, that at the very least this is amongst the top ten uh, important letters that Srila Prabhupada wrote in regard to how much it has been quoted and considered and interpreted. Now, there's a lot to it. It's an extremely long letter. I'm not going to get into all the facets of it because we're going to stay on point. But nevertheless, this letter was to Karanthar. And he, along with Hunks Duda, were, it could be said, were the chief instigators of that centralization scheme, which was checked but not uprooted. So the excerpt reads here Do not centralize anything. Each temple must remain independent and self-sufficient. That was my plan from the very beginning, why you are thinking otherwise. Once before you wanted to do something centralizing with your GBC meeting, and if I did not interfere, the whole thing would have been killed. Do not think in this way of big corporation, big credit, centralization. These are all nonsense proposals. Krishna consciousness movement is for training men to be independently thoughtful and competent in all types of departments of knowledge and action, not for making bureaucracy. Once there is bureaucracy, the whole thing will be spoiled. There's a lot to dig into here. Do not centralize anything. Right now, the Governing Body Commission can argue that they're not a centralized force, but clearly the GBC is the power node of the fabricated so-called ISKCON, and the temple presidents are way down on the totem pole compared to the GBC. Srila Prabhupada wanted his devotees to become self-sufficient, to be bold, daring, and active in the service of the Lord, to work their way up to the Madhyam Adhikari platform, where they had a type of steadiness in Krishna consciousness, having previously overcome all in Arthas, where they were fixed in firm faith in Krishna consciousness, and wherein, if his divine grace wanted to, he could authorize all of them. All my disciples will take the legacy. He could authorize any one of them or all of them to become initiating spiritual masters or Diksha gurus. And thus, the Krishna Consciousness Movement would flourish. The GBC was meant, in such a bona fide atmosphere, to be a watchdog. In other words, if some guru became flagrant, a flagrant enjoyer, a wild card, started advocating all kinds of sahajism and acting on it, and by the way, that went down big time in 1978, then the GBC as a watchdog would come in and say, no, unfortunately this man is no longer guru. The GBC was not meant to appoint spiritual masters. The GBC was not meant to 
create zones where zonal acharyas, popes of the zone, ruled supreme, and where for many years those zonal acharyas made sure that none of their god brothers could act as spiritual masters. Of course, even if they did recognize that, it wouldn't make any of them bona fide. They'd all be bogus because the whole scheme was bogus. But the point here, Prabhupada says that he does not want centralization. He wants his disciples to become strong on their own volition, through their own actions, through their own seva, through their own powerful preaching, and thus to be able to be eligible to receive the order to become Diksha Guru. Previous to that, perhaps they reach the stage where they're Shiksha Guru. Shiksha Guru is not on a lower level than Diksha Guru. The noun is Guru. The adjective is Shiksha, the adjective is Diksha. The noun is Guru. Guru is one. But a Diksha Guru in our line needs to receive authorization from His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada directly. Not an appointment from the Governing Body Commission. Not a voted in Guru by the Governing Body Commission. Not to wait in queue for one year or two years or three years having applied to some kind of sub committee for application that I want to be recognized by the governing body as a guru. What is this? If you're already at the stage, if you're already at the level of realization of a Diksha Guru and you've received the order from Prabhupada, why do you got to wait in line for that? Wait in queue for the governing body commission to rubber stamp it? Of course, they're totally bona fide, so, oh, bogus, so because they're totally bogus, in one sense you could say it doesn't matter. And it doesn't. But the point of the matter here is that Prabhupada's plan was non-centralization, no bureaucracy, no big credits, no centralization, no big corporation. Now, in this excerpt, Prabhupada says, if I did not interfere, the whole thing would have been killed. He's referring to the centralization scheme six months previous which he was able to interfere with and stifle, but not uproot. He says that had he not been able to interfere, his movement would have been killed. The whole thing would have been killed. Now, let us develop a little perspective here. What was being done in that ad hoc meeting in the early spring of 1972? One man outside the commission was brought in, he was working at an investment house, and it was arranged that all the zones would wrap up their satellite centers and go to wherever was the main temple, where the GBC was, and then all the monies would be funneled to that, that devotee who was in the investment firm for investment in a mutual fund or whatever in order to increase the profits, so-called. Now, that was a major change, there's no doubt about it. But the, can that be compared to the 11 pretender Mahabhagavats and the zonal scheme? These are not comparable in scale. It was a major deviation in 1972. But the deviation of March 1978 was far, far more deviant far greater. Eleven men who were unqualified were declared to be Mahabhagavats given zones of complete authority wherein anyone coming into their zone was told you've come here because you're meant by Krishna to be initiated by this zone Lacharya. And they were worshipped by their god brothers and god sisters as Uttama Adhikaris. The colossal hoax was a complete cataclysm. It was an unprecedented deviation. You can say it's got its precedent in the Gaudiya Math, but that was one man who was selected as the Acharya. The fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, its power nodes selected, approved, appointed, or said that Prabhupada arranged for 11 such Sampradaya Acharyas. And all of them 
were Prakritas Sahajyas as soon as they accepted those roles. Now, if Prabhupada says here that the whole thing would have been killed by the centralization scheme of 1972, then what did transpire in March of 1978? And also, just as importantly, and on the same uh, particular avenue of understanding, his divine grace suspended the governing body commission in 1972, briefly, but he did suspend it. So it was designed to take the power of the temple presidents away, so Prabhupada gave it a strong slap and took its power away and gave all the power back to the temple presidents, where it had been from 1966 until late July of 1970. So he suspended the GBC for the centralization scheme, and there's plenty of centralization now, and there has been for decades, and bureaucracy. But what would he have done with the governing body if he was still present and it allowed for these zonal acharyas to be worshipped by their god brothers and god sisters when he never recognized anybody as Diksha Guru? In 1977 in July, he recognized on two successive days a total of 11 Ritviks, Ritvik acharyas, not Diksha Guru acharyas. And the misconception the motivated presumption that such Ritviks would automatically then become Diksha Gurus upon Prabhupada's disappearance. Ritvik Acharya, then it becomes as good as Acharya, which they heard, but not from Prabhupada. That is a presumption that has no basis in Vedic or Vaishnava authority or tradition. What would Prabhupada have done if that scam came across and he was still present? He would not merely have suspended the GBC, he would have dismantled it permanently. We should have complete confidence in that because that's what needs to be done. The abolition of the GBC is integral to be able to have the Krishna consciousness movement once more expand in a perfect and pure way throughout the world. And it will not be able to do so as long as this roof of all these deviations, all these so-called reforms, which were nothing but damage control, all the influence of the GBC touch of evil that went into dormancy in 1972, incubated, came out briefly in 75, and then exploded in March of 1978. Unless this whole roof is removed, everybody is bollocked up. The Krishna consciousness movement is bollocked up. Now let us continue to the rest of the excerpt here. Krishna consciousness movement is for training men to be independently thoughtful and competent in all types of departments of knowledge and action, not for making bureaucracy. Once there is bureaucracy, the whole thing is spoiled. Shouldn't we take him at his word? There's a massive ISKCON bureaucracy now. All kinds of midi committees and subcommittees. It's, they're all served but one purpose ultimately, and that is to act as buffers for the governing body commission itself, so it doesn't have to deal with the real issues, the root issues. Instead, you get these tempests in the teapots. For example, oh, the two lines of authority, the GBC and the temple president on one hand and the initiating guru on the other hand, who has the real authority? First of all, you have to have bona fide gurus, and they don't have that. Then you have the other tempest in the teapot, the female diksha guru issue. We shall not delve into that now, right at this time. But the point of the matter is that these things are not root issues. The root issue is what transpired in 1978 and everything connected to it previous to that. 
and the ad hoc deviation of the centralization scheme was not simply meant only to take the power away from the presidents, which it certainly did in 1978 when it resurfaced in a big way. It was also meant to create a machine, an automatic machine, an automatic money machine by the funneling all the funds into the investment house and then making profits via the well-designed mutual funds or however that was supposed to be done. And also, the machine of that the governing body commissioners just let everything happen automatically, but all the power flows to them at all times because that's the way they designed it. Remember, those 11 pretender Mahabhagavats created their own zonal GBC within the GBC. In other words, because they heard that bad advice from Navadweep, they were told, no, nobody can check the guru. So then the zonal acharyas, all 11 of whom were governing body commissioners themselves and who constituted for all practical purposes just one vote short of half of the commission, but constituted well over 80, 85 percent of the power of the commission, they created the acharya board which was not answerable to the GBC. So when the Zonal Acharya scam came down, basically in April and May of 1978, it created an automatic machine whereby all the power got funneled at all times into those 11 men. The presidents became yes men. And the other GBCs, abdicated their duties by allowing this to go on and they all were pushed to the side. In other words, the disciples, the new disciples who came in and a significant percentage of Prabhupada's initiates also because they had been trained by that, that way previously anyway, they no longer looked to their GBC if he wasn't an initiating guru. They looked to the initiating guru of the zone, the zone Lacharya. And that's what that scheme, the twofold objectives of that centralization scheme were. Take the power away from the temple presidents and create a machine that runs on automatic, automatic pilot for their benefit, always for their benefit. And both were accomplished. In fact, beyond their wildest dreams in one sense, because not only did they take the power away from the temple presidents, they took the power away from all the other GBCs simultaneously also. And they did create a type of automatic autopilot, which would, be continue, would be continuing to this day had not they been so weak and so egotistical that they made war upon each other. Not all of them did this, but enough of them did this. And when they did, then combined with some criminality that came out about their actions and some extremely immoral activities by two in particular, the whole thing eventually got exposed, but it took time. It took around eight years for it to crater. And then you had, of course, the second transformation, which was the second reform movement as damage control. So where is this all coming from? It's coming from a tendency in the part of conditioned souls to be want to be worshipped as gurus and since in our line and in every Vaishnava line the guru is considered to be Shakshad Hari wanting to be worshipped in this way, enviousness of Prabhupada, since he was worshipped as an Uttamadakari, which he definitely was, and still is, of course. So Prabhupada could foresee that his movement would go off the rails. After all, misuse of free will is what it is. Free will is what it is, and being able to misuse it is what it is. So he actually indirectly, but not too indirectly, warned about it 
in a purport to Mantra 12 of the Sri Yishupanishad, a book that came out very early in his movement. We shall now read from the very end of that commentary. I'm choosing to take this from, not, not directly from this book, although what's in there doesn't really change the substance. It doesn't, there's no changes of substance, but there is changes of words. I prefer the, the wording that's present in the 2003 folio the Veda base, and it is as follows. By a false display of religious sentiments, they present a show of devotional service while indulging in all sorts of immoral activities. In this way, they pass as spiritual masters and devotees of God. To mislead the people in general, they themselves become so-called acharyas, but they do not even follow the principles of the acharyas. These rogues are the most dangerous elements in human society. Sri Ishupanishad confirms that these pseudo-religionists are heading toward the most obnoxious place in the universe after the completion of their spiritual master business, which they conduct simply for sense gratification. Tatvamasi, there has been a long-standing dissension between the crypto-Talmudists of the fabricated so-called ISKCON and the Vaishnavs genuinely initiated by Srila Prabhupada who never bought in to their imposed hierarchy and its overemphasis on extravagant rituals. Any false historical narrative which is allowed to remain in the ascendant at the present time will simply serve to perpetuate this fire of dissension. Some devotees enjoy this great battle. Other devotees are appalled by it and still others are either ignorant of it or neglectful. But if we dismiss the, histories, the history of Prabhupada's movement or worse if we buy into its institutional distortion, we shall be condemned, as Santayana warned, to have to relive it almost certainly in a worse way, as in a much, much worse way. Because ISKCON has its sights set on becoming, at bare minimum, the power behind the throne of a kind of one-world techno-theocratic Leviathan composed of its so-called Brahmins grinding the political gears from the other side of the curtain. That would make for a neo-Gothic living hell, especially for genuine devotees. His divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, is no longer physically present to act as the final arbiter. As such, from one perspective, you may consider that he remains silent about the current controversy and the current conflict. Excerpts from his letters and books, however, indicate otherwise. He is still fully present in that written record. But similar to Lord Shiva remaining tolerant during the Daksha sacrifice, he is relying upon his disciples to maintain his honor and preserve his legacy. Our challenge is to overcome the unsteady material field and all the pseudo-spiritual and pseudo-devotional complications that it has spawned. The leading secretaries of ISKCON are the ones who created this dissension in the first place, and it's now our duty to confront it and to expose it for just what it is. Exposing it in that way does not increase the fire of dissension, but will eventually serve to terminate it. Preaching against the ISKCON narrative is integral to terminating all these deviations. Misuse of a great science does not render it useless, but the bhakti science will become covered over for a period of time and will appear to be lost for a period of time. And during that period of time, there will be much suffering and many atrocities. 
if we do not now work to resuscitate the narrative of the actual history of Srila Prabhupada's Krishna movement. The ISKCON machine has to be stopped. And as Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov Lenin said about his communist movement on his deathbed with his mouth half paralyzed, the machine is got out of control. Sadeva Samya.